What I'm going to talk to you to, about today is the uh, navigating the public debate about sexuality. This is a particularly hot topic, and Christians are particularly their contribution to this conversation is very unwelcome at the moment. So. Since ACL is so good at just wading in at the uncomfortable issues, let's just get started and go there. Um, one of the things that I get to do in my job is to sit there listening to a lot of activists and listening to different points of view and really considering what it is, not just the words that they're using, but what they mean by those words. And it occurred to me that there's a lot of name calling and mudslinging. It's very difficult to have a civil debate about this subject at the moment. And it's really because everybody's convinced they have the high moral ground. And they're convinced that they have the right conclusions and there's only one right way to think about it. And in all of the mudslinging and the name calling, we're not really understanding why people of goodwill can come to completely different points of view on the same subject. And when you really tap down into it, the reason that we think different things is because actually we're appealing to different ideas about human ontology, the human person, what is good for human flourishing. So ontology is that branch of philosophy that considers the nature of something. What is it that makes this apple an apple? Uh, how is this apple different to other apples? How is it different to oranges? What, what is the appleiness of this apple? And so when we think about human ontology, what is it that makes us human? What is it that we believe about the fundamental nature of the human person? And then how does sexuality fit into that? And when you ask those questions of the public debate, then you realise that there are really three different um, parts of the conversation, and I'm going to unpack those today. And if at the end of all of this we can't agree on a conclusion of what is the right thing to think, at least you might not persuade everyone in the public what is the right thing to think, at least we'll agree on what it is that we're disagreeing about. So hopefully I'll bring some clarity out of the chaos and at least we'll understand what the different points of view are, why different people think what they think. So the three points of view that I want to talk about are, um, are these. There's the traditional Judeo-Christian view, which emphasises sexual morality. And then there's the mainstream view, which believes in sexual orientation. And then the third part of the conversation that I'll come to at the end is the sexual rights activists. And they really emphasise um, sexual diversity or sexual liberty. Now, quite often in the public debates, if you listen to the words sexual diversity and born that way, you'll think that they're talking about the same thing. But if we separate them out and un tap down into what they're really talking about in terms of human ontology, what is it that we're believing about the human person, you realise that they're actually appealing to very different ideas. So we'll start on the comfortable ground of Judeo-Christian, the Judeo-Christian view of what we think about the human person and human sexuality. So the Judeo-Christian view is that everyone is equal in inherent human dignity. Every person is an intentional creation of God. Human nature is sinful, but we are not slaves to sin. We can choose not to act on our sinful nature. Sexual sin is possible for everyone. So depravity is not confined to particular types of people. It's a universal possibility. And that's quite egalitarian, really, because it results in one single sexual standard for everybody. Sexual temptation of every type needs to be resisted by everyone. And this results in a very narrow sexual ethic, which means that it's only OK within marriage for procreation and intimacy. So because we believe that sexual sin hurts ourselves and others, this results in a moral imperative to use this gift wisely. Because God loves the, the sinner, he hates the sin. But on the other hand, we think that sexuality is really a small and probably quite insignificant part of the total human identity. So in this view, celibacy is both possible and harmless, regardless of what Freud and later Kinsey had to say on the subject. But what we're dealing with is um, a, 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 the idea of sexual orientation. And sexual orientation is the ideological descendant of an earlier idea of the homosexual, which comes from the 19th century. So I'll explain a little bit about this, because we're often blamed for this idea of being nasty to the homosexual. But I want to um, explain that it's actually not a Christian concept at all. In 12th century medieval penitentials, you see medieval history can be related to every subject. <laughs> In 12th century medieval penitentials, you have sodomy listed as a type of sin. There's a class of sin called luxuria, which is to do with self-indulgence. The love of fine clothing and gluttony and sodomy are all listed in the same class of sin. But you don't have the sodomite until the mid-19th century. So the sodomite is the personification of the sin. It's a sort of caricature of depravity. But it's not a Christian concept. It actually comes from the transfer of moral authority from 
um, the church to science. So they wanted to find a way to maintain the existing moral authority. We still want homosexuality to be considered a bad thing. How do we do that? Well, I know what we'll do is we'll associate it with lunacy. We'll, we'll um, uh, isolate it and um, create this caricature of depravity to say that science says that homosexuality is a bad thing. So. And this comes from Foucault, who is not normally the friend of Christians, but he agrees that this concept of the sodomite was the product of um, pseudoscience from the 19th century. It's not a Christian idea. But the important thing about this idea of the sodomite is that it links identity and behaviour and makes the two things inextricable. So in this view, the um, behaviour colonises the whole identity of the person. Nothing that went into the homosexual's total composition was unaffected by his sexuality. It was everywhere present in him. It was at the root of all of his actions. So this conflation of sexuality and identity is ultimately quite unhelpful because it directs the discussion to an argument about whether the homosexual is virtuous or sinful. Because some people were saying, but we know some homosexuals and they're quite nice, really. They're not a danger to society. You know, they don't look crazy. You, they're actually quite normal people. And that, of course, is perfectly true. So what we end up with is trying to redeem this pathologized identity of the homosexual and say, no, no, homosexuals are just the same as everybody else. Or they're different. Are they virtuous or are they more sinful? I don't know, but we're arguing about the ontology of the homosexual, which is ultimately an unhelpful idea because as Christians, we don't need to argue about the homosexual. That's not a Christian concept. And I want to suggest to you that that's um, actually a very helpful position for us because we don't need to defend the homosexual. That's not a hill we need to die on. That's not part of our conversation. In fact, um, you know, Milo Yiannopoulos thought he was being very outrageous recently when he said lesbians don't exist, but I want to be even more outrageous and say, actually, in Christian thought, homosexuals don't exist either. What we have is men and women who have same-sex attraction, men and women who practice homosexuality, but they're people first, they're not a sexual identity. So, um, thank you. So that's good news for us, we can get out of that conversation, but we are still um, dealing with this mainstream belief, which is the legacy issue from this Victorian pathologist pathologized identity of sexual orientation. And it has surprising currency. Most people would accept this as a no-brainer. They just think this is everybody believes in sexual orientation. So in this view, just to tap into what they're believing about human ontology, they're believing that you can categorize humanity into little separate boxes according to this thing called sexual orientation. Sexual orientation is a thing. It's innate, it's unchosen, and it's fixed. So it's analogous to race. And in the political debates of the 1970s and 80s, this was used by the gay rights movement. They picked up the, um, the, the race rhetoric that had been used rightly and very successfully by the civil rights movement. So the civil rights movement said, discrimination against black people is wrong, race is innate and unchosen and fixed, and therefore discrimination is morally uh, contemptible. And that's a perfectly uh, right argument. And so the gay rights movement just picked up that rhetoric and said, you know, sexual orientation is innate and fixed and unchanging as well and therefore you can't discriminate against us. Um, and that's very useful politically because it means that anyone who criticizes their rhetoric is the moral equivalent of a, a racist. So we're a homophobe suddenly, this is a terrible thing where this, we are pathologized, where we lose the moral high ground because of this orientation argument. But according to this belief in, in orientation, um, all people are equal. And since all people are equal, but sexual orientations are different, well then all sexual orientations must also be equal. And the behaviors that flow from those orientations must also be okay. So we've got identity linked to behavior still. And then because we believe that sex is part of love and connection and it's a basic human need, well then we need to extend that to homosexuals as well. So in this view, homosexual behaviours are natural to the homosexual person because they have a different ontology and their behaviours flow from that ontology in exactly the same way that heterosexual behaviours flow from a heterosexual ontology. Is that making sense? And then we have this explained for us by Michael Kirby. He's tapping into this idea, former um, High Court Justice. And he says, if sexuality arises out of your orientation, then it is just irrational to persist with the demonization of sexual acts because they are the acts that are natural to the homosexual person to reach out for fullness of being, for love of another, for companionship and for fidelity and trust in another human being. Now, this is good for the heterosexual people and it is a noble and wonderful thing in life. <laughs> 
So that's a whitewash on what actually goes on in a lot of homosexual cultures, but you can see that what's being appealed to is the idea that these people are different but equal, and therefore all the behaviours that, that come out of the, this orientation must also be different but equal. But if you talk to people who believe in born that way, they're very nice people, and they're, they're, they're generally, they're not as progressive or outrageous or radical as they like to think. Um, so they, they still think, if you say diversity to this group, well, they just think that you're valuing people equally while maintaining the existing equality for everybody, and we would all agree with that as a good moral proposition. And when you say inclusion to this group, well, they think that means including a fixed minority within the existing heteronormative social order, and they're still in favour of democratic pluralism, they're still in favour of support for the family, and they're still in favour of child protection. So I have a lot of kind of left-leaning social justice friends, and they would definitely fall into this camp. We agree on a lot of things. We agree on more things than we disagree about, but they believe sexual orientation. And this idea has such valency that most people are um, convinced that we can just assume that this is the truth. So we have Peter Fitzsimons, who said this recently, well, we used to think that people who were left-handed were an aberration, that they were a problem, and we used to think that people who were gay were a problem and that they were an aberration. But 21st century, we understand that being gay is like being left-handed, like having red hair, like having freckles. It's no big deal. So he's very sure that this is the only enlightened view on the subject. And it's no big deal is an interesting statement because for a lot of homosexuals, it's a really big deal. So how do we talk about this if we just say, accept, shut down, you're a homophobe, when we're beaten out of the public square, we're not even allowed to examine what's going on behind that. So I'm going to do that today. There are four problems with what Peter Fitzsimons is saying, and I'll go through them each quickly. Problem number one. Sexual orientation is not a thing. It is many things. I can recommend this uh, report. It was produced in 2015 by Mayer and McHugh, highly protested by the activists, because, of course, they don't want anybody saying anything about it. But it's a uh, very well-reasoned um, discussion of quite a lot of the scientific findings on gender and sexuality. So it tells you what the studies are, what their limitations are, what we can tell from them, what we can't tell from them. It's a, it's a very good discussion, so I can recommend that. And one of the points that they make in it is that when we are looking empirically to study sexual orientation, what are we actually studying? What, what, what's the data that's feeding into this? Because when you look at sexual orientation, you realise that actually there's lots of different things that you can measure. You can measure attractions, behaviours, identity, self-label. You can measure belonging to a certain community. Are we talking about fantasies, felt needs for certain forms of companionship? What are we actually talking about when we talk about sexual orientation? And then... Even if we talk about any one of those things, what, if, what about attraction, for example? Well, these things can be hard to define. How do you define attraction? Are we talking about arousal patterns or romantic feelings or desires for company? And then are these feelings present sporadically or temporarily or pervasively or long-term, exclusively or not exclusively? Are they deep or shallow? So how do you measure feelings? And the problem is that all of these things vary independently. So the more carefully researchers map these constellations and the more complicated the picture becomes because few individuals report uniform intercorrelations between these domains. So what this means is that you actually just can't put people in boxes and the more carefully you look at it, the less you can put them in boxes, the more boxes you need and the less people fit into them. So we're dealing with individuals, not identities. So sexual orientation is not a thing, it's, it's actually a sort of basket of ill-defined variables. Problem number two, even if it were a thing, so what? So the born that way thesis makes us ask the wrong questions because it drives us to think that we're dealing with an inherited concept of the homosexual and we're just trying to redeem it. So we end up saying, is the homosexual the same or different? Is the homosexual good or bad, virtuous or sinful? And these are just the wrong questions to be asking when you're dealing with people. When you're dealing with people, much better questions to ask might be, must same-sex attracted people act on those attractions? So, for example, um, if we don't understand the nature of bisexuality very well, and bisexuals are complaining that they have been um, underrepresented, in, underrepresented in the literature. We recognise homosexuals and lesbians and think that there aren't very many bisexuals. So if a married woman with three children goes along to the counsellor and says, I've found that I'm having same-sex attractions, 
The counsellor might say, ah, oh, that's because you're a lesbian, actually. You never realised this before, but that's actually who you really are. And therefore, the only path to flourishing for you is to embrace who you really are, accept it and act upon it and leave your husband and children and go and often live with your girlfriend. But then two years later, she realises that, oh, actually, I do still fancy my husband. Maybe I'm bisexual. Well, that's not a very helpful outcome for her, is it? Because do we always need to act on our sexual attractions? And we wouldn't make the same... I, we wouldn't give the same advice to a man who came along, married with three children, and said, I've discovered that, actually, I fancy 20-year-olds. <laughs> Much more than 40-year-olds. I think... I think I'm oriented towards 20-year-olds, and the only way for me to live a flourishing life is to leave my wife and children and shack up with a 20-year-old. So why do we suddenly make different moral judgments about same-sex attracted behaviours rather than not heterosexual behaviours? And the only reason we do is because of this idea of ontology. So it's actually very unhelpful to individuals in making good choices for their lives. Can we live flourishing lives without acting on our sexual impulses? Yes, I think we can. Um, and must a same-sex attraction determine our life's trajectory? And what about unwanted same-sex attraction? Because I would have thought that if you had red hair or freckles and you were unhappy about it, that you should be able to go along to the counsellor and talk about that, but apparently not because that's part of your orientation and you just must accept it. So it leads us into unhelpful directions for counselling as well. So Mayor and McHugh ask this very sensible question, which is, isn't it just better to take identity out of it and ask instead what behaviours, whether in the sexual realm or elsewhere, tend to be conducive to health and flourishing and what kinds of behaviours tend to undermine a healthy life and flourishing? Very good questions. So problem number three is that born that way is wrong. Sexuality is not innate and fixed. Somebody almost fell off their chair a couple of weeks ago and I said, oh, they're not born that way. What? What? You can't possibly say that. Anyway, so here's the evidence. I'll just go through it uh, briefly. There, there's a lot more, but these are just some useful studies for those that want to look into the, the detail of this a bit more. Um, Dr. Lisa Diamond is a lesbian activist. She's the co-editor of the American Psychological Association Handbook on Sexuality and Psychology. And she's done a lot of longitudinal studies on adult women, uh, lesbian communities, and noticed that their identity, their attractions, and their behaviours all vary independently over time. So that shows that sexuality is fluid. All three of those domains, attractions, behaviours, and identity, vary for adult women, was her conclusion. And then she did similar research for men and wrote an article saying... I was wrong. Sexuality is pretty damn fluid for men too. So what she's come up with is the contention, well supported by evidence, that sexuality is fluid for both adolescents and adults and for men and women. Then, so we know that it's, it's, it's fluid, it's not fixed. And then we have the second one here, Frisch and Vid. I'm not, you know, apologies to any Danes in the room. I'm probably mispronouncing that horribly. But they did a population study of 2 million Danish people in 2006, a survey, a, a survey of population. And what they, came, what they found was that the likelihood of entering a same-sex relationship in adulthood was much greater for people who, had, who were missing a parent in childhood, and specifically missing the same-sex parent in childhood. Now, the correlation was so strong that they could even say for every year that that parent was missing, the chances of entering a same-sex relationship in adulthood increased. There's a very, very strong correlation. So what they said, their conclusion to, in all of this was... Um, oh, sorry, go back. We're not up to problem four yet. Prenatal factors alone cannot determine, cannot account for the variation in human sexual orientations. Whatever ingredients determine a person's sexual preferences and marital choices, our population-based study shows that environmental factors are important. We have the National Longitudinal Study of Adolescent Health in America, which has been following the same cohort of 12,000 children from the 1990s. And what they've found is that the majority, so over 80% of the children who report same-sex attraction in, adult, in adolescence will identify as heterosexual after the age of 25. So there's been a lot of academic to and fro about why this might be, speculation about how we account, is it actually they were same-sex attracted and they changed, and there's evidence for that. On the other hand, there's also evidence that they were just filling out the survey in a cavalier way when they were... Um, teenagers. So there's the jokester element. And one of the funny bits of evidence for that is that um, when in the teenage cohort, there were several hundred students reported that they had an artificial limb. 
And then when they caught up with them face to face after the age of 25, those limbs had grown back and there were only two. <laughs> so there's definitely evidence for the jokester element. I'll come back to the surveillance studies at the, uh, later on, I'm going to dig into some of that evidence, but this is a really good um, survey of youth health that's run by the National Centers for Disease Control and Prevention in the USA, and it studies um, 15 and a half thousand students between the ages of 14 and 17, and it covers a lot of different health indices. And I'll come back to the evidence that comes from that in a moment. One other piece of evidence for the idea that sex sexual orientation is not fixed comes from Kinsey's pedophiles. So in 1948, um, Dr. Alfred Kinsey published The Sexual Behaviour of the Human Male, which was supposed to be the landmark study to, you know, bring the white light of science onto the study, study of uh, human sexuality. And he took advice from experts in juvenile sexuality, so we would call them pedophiles, and it was the opinion of these men that if you wanted to cultivate a lifelong homosexual partner, you needed to get to the boy before he came through puberty. Ideally before puberty, but if, he, if a boy got through puberty without having received this sexual instruction from an older man, then he was very likely to be heterosexual. So they certainly didn't think that it was fixed. And the pornography as industry as well is a massive commercial, big example of how um, th that is actually makes its money on cultivating new sexual interests and um, manipulating our, our sexual behaviours. So we know, um, you know, they know very well that sexuality isn't fixed. Now, problem number four. This is the last one, but it's the biggest one. My problem with, with the born that way narrative is that if we believe born that way, then it supports what I call the stigma narrative. You'll be familiar with the stigma narrative. It's, uh, it's been supposedly proven by some research from La Trobe University in the 90s um, in a series of studies called Writing Themselves In, and it goes like this. Same-sex attracted youth suffer high levels of verbal and physical homophobic abuse, particularly at school. Homophobic abuse is causally related to feeling of feeling unsafe, excessive drug use, self-harm and suicide attempts. Therefore, we need an anti-bullying program. So this was the rationale for safe schools. Um, I won't even go into that research because it's... Uh, so, but, but what this narrative does is it says, look, we have equality of beginnings because born that way means that you know, we're different but equal. Therefore, if we have inequality of outcomes, well, it must be because there's something going on in between. That must be homophobia, must be stigma, something extrinsic to the individual. So this is a really unhelpful thing because it creates them and us distinctions and it shuts down debate. Anyone who questions this is guilty of homophobia and contributing to the problem. And this is really the argument that has helped to beat Christians out of the public square on this issue. The research was not designed to support same-sex attracted youth. It was designed, in their own words, to support social change. So we're now dealing with a, a, a much more radical part of the conversation that I'll come to in a moment. So if we believe the stigma narrative, then we don't examine other evidence of what is going on for these particular kids. And this is where I'll come back to the US surveillance studies, because unlike writing themselves in, they have a very good data set. So when the academics who wanted to write writing themselves in came along, they said, ah, we'll confect the, the, the questionnaire that will give us the outcomes that we want to prove our pre-concocted thesis. Uh, but in America, when they wanted to prove the same thesis, they already had a really, really good, well-designed, large-scale um, survey. So they didn't need to reproduce the wheel, they just added the LGBT question into it. And then they looked at the evidence, evidence and they said, ah, oh, yes, LGB kids are scoring worse on all of these health indices. Clearly, it's stigma. We need a social, a, a school bullying program, anti-bullying program. So they still followed on the, the narrative, but they ignored what I think is some significant confounding evidence. So, this is what else we know if we go and dig into that study, what else is going on for these kids. You find that LGB kids are less likely to eat enough fruit, and they're not eating as many vegetables as other children. They're less likely to eat breakfast, less likely to drink milk, less likely to drink two or more glasses of water a day, less likely to sleep an average of eight hours a night, less likely to participate in 60 minutes of physical activity for at least one day of the week, and they're less likely to have seen a dentist in the last 12 months. Now, can we explain all of that with stigma? I mean, you, you could if people are depressed, they don't exercise, they might not be looking after themselves, so that there's some evidence there. But on the other hand, the dentist thing, you would have to believe that 
all of those parents out there say, well, I'm going to take the two eldest ones, but that gay one, they're not coming to the dentist. Which is clearly absurd. Parents love all their children equally, so you know, there's some evidence there that just doesn't quite fit with the stigma argument. And then when we go and look at the next, what kids are, what they're more likely to be doing, we find that LGB kids are more likely to use drugs, more likely to suffer depression, attempt suicide, use computers more than three hours a day, which is linked to antisocial behaviours or social dysfunction, more likely to struggle with obesity. They're more likely to have had sex before the age of 13. I'm going to come back to that one. They're more likely to have been raped. They're more likely to have been made to do unwanted sexual acts by a partner. They're more likely to have been deliberately hurt by a sexual partner. So this is someone they're going out with. And they're more likely to have had sex with more than four sexual partners. So these kids are 14 to 17 years old. And the question then arises, if you have this child who you're a school counsellor, imagine, and this child comes into your office and says, yes, I was raped by my uncle when I was eight and I'm depressed and suicidal and I'm now navigating some fairly dicey sexual cultures, would you say to that child, do you know, I think it's stigma. That's your problem. You'd feel so much better if people didn't bully you. We're just not looking at what's going on for these kids. And if we misdiagnose the problem, we're not going to help them. We're not dealing with people. Instead, we're thinking of identities and thinking that there's a one-size-fits-all solution for all LGB kids when actually we should be looking at what is really going on for these children. So this is the effect of the Born That Way narrative. It creates ideological blindness so that we don't see what else is going on. So let's look at child, how, that, how that applies then. If we just think about child sexual abuse victimisation, for example, if you don't have your Born That Way goggles on, there are three different ways, which are not mutually exclusive, that you might understand the high correlation between an LGBT identity in adulthood and experiences of child sexual abuse victimisation. You might think, number one, that childhood sexual abuse contributes to the development of a non-heterosexual orientation in adulthood. And that's certainly what Kinsey's pedophiles would say. Option number two, you might think that children with signs of a future non-heterosexual tendencies attract abusers, placing them at an elevated risk. And that's what the activists would say, because that's the born that way narrative. That fits in with the stigma argument that uh, pedophiles particularly pick on the LGBT kids and because uh, the pedophile's homophobic. Anyway, but that's what they're saying is going on. Option number three, you might think that there are certain factors which contribute both to childhood sexual abuse victimisation and non-heterosexual tendencies, such as a dysfunctional family or an alcoholic parent. And that then fits with some of the other evidence of not eating vegetables and not going to the dentist, and also these dicey, risk, risk, these dicey cultures that they're navigating. So I think, actually, there's evidence that all three are true, and we should be examining all three. But the effect of the stigma narrative is that we block out one and three, and we only look at number two, and that's how they explain it. So who is it that would want us to not look at really what's going on for these kids? Um, because it's heartless if we don't help them, if we're not really looking at the problem closely. And I want to explain this in terms of the third part of the conversation, which is the Sexual Diversity Liberation Bunch. So these people are sexual rights activists and they do not believe in born that way. They advocate for freedom to be who you really are. And quite often people will think that that's just another way of saying born that way. But in fact, what they're advocating for is sexual diversity for everyone. So in some ways, they start with a Christian proposition. They say, you know, depravity, though they don't call it that, depravity is a universal possibility. Only they think it's a good idea and we don't think so. We think it hurts people, whereas they think actually we're all queer, only we're all oppressed into little heteronormative boxes because we're culturally conditioned to believe that heterosexuality is normal. And if you listen to their narratives, they really have a kind of enlightenment, like the lights have switched on and we see it all differently. It's quasi mystical, it's not scientific, but it's, it's very interesting to listen to. So in order to understand their worldview, you have to sort of bend your mind into some interesting shapes, but you know, stick with me. So the human person is reconceived as a, a soji, a, 
everything that's important and unique and wonderful and special about you can be encapsulated into your sexual orientation and your gender identity. So this is a disembodied identity. Your body has nothing to do with it. And that's very interesting when you think about what that does. Your body is not who you really are, which means your parents have not contributed anything to that identity. It's very isolating. It's really fascinating. We could go down that rabbit hole, but I'll avoid it. So we've got soji, that's one of the elements of it. And then from Kinsey in the 1940s and 50s, we have the idea that sexual diversity is normal because it is natural for the human animal. So this is his idea of anthropology, is that actually the, the human animal is just mammalian, we're a sort of collection of physiological processes. So we can think of sexual responses as a bit like digestion. Now, we don't judge people on what kind of food they like to eat, do we? So why should we judge people on what kind of sexual practices they get a kick out of? Because it actually doesn't mean anything. It's just a physiological response. It's not connected to the human person. It's got no spiritual significance. It's actually completely immaterial what you like to do sexually. So that means that um, the problem, he, he's the author of the stigma narrative, that the only problem is that we've applied this false morality to sexuality and we've made people feel guilty about it. And if we just lifted that morality off, then everyone would be fine and we'd all be able to enjoy curry and mooncakes and <laughs> ice cream, you know, of, of whatever flavour, and nobody should be judged on what they eat or what kind of sex they like to have. So that means that all sexual expression is legitimate. And when I say all, I mean all, which means polyamory, BDSM, pedophilia, incest, bestiality, it's all fine as far as Kinsey is concerned because it's just like digestion, right? It's a physiological response. So also feeding into this mindset is neo-Marxist ideas that sexual morality is oppressive, heteronormativity and the family are tools of the capitalist system of production and consumption to you know, keep us in our places so that we keep on reproducing the workforce. And actually everyone will be better when the queer revolution comes and we're all liberated into the queer identities that are, that are our natural state. They also believe the queer minority will always be othered in a heteronormative society. So what they're aiming at is comprehensive social, radical social revolution. So we need the queer revolution in order to achieve inclusion. So inclusion means something very different if you talk to people who um, adhere to this point of view. This, this, this is not mainstream Australia. This is a radical, a very small radical minority, but they've perpetuated born that way. And they say, oh, look, we're just advocating for born that way. But actually, they're advocating for something much more radical. Who are they and what do they want? Well, they're the militant gay lobby, which used to be called the Gay Liberation Front, and they advocate for LGBT rights. We have the sex industry, so this is pornography, sex toy shops, and they advocate for sex workers' rights. We have abortion and sexual health providers, and that's a multi-billion dollar industry worldwide. <laughs> Pedophiles and their advocate, advocates, and they advocate for children's sexual rights. Um, Marxists and queer revolutionaries. And then there's a sort of new generation a non-binary priesthood of superheroes who have the queer touch and want to liberate everyone from the oppression of gender norms and heteronormativity. <coughs> the important thing to realise is that all of these people, these are the same people using the same arguments to advocate for the same things. You cannot differentiate and say, oh, look, there's the gay lot over here and the abortionists over there. They are the same individuals and this is their rhetoric that we are using when we um, go along with Born That Way. So, they don't believe born that way, but it really serves their cause, so they keep it going. So, let's look at the stigma argument to show you that this, these are the same people, these are their arguments. This is the stigma argument as it plays out in different settings. We, if we look at um, prostitution, you'll find that the advocates for sex workers' rights use the stigma argument. So, we notice that prostituted women have statistically higher levels of PTSD and lower life outcomes. They're much more likely to use drugs. They're not very happy people. How do we explain that? Well, it can't be anything to do with the sex, can it? Because they're empowered sex workers. <laughs> and it's just a process of digestion. It's like sticking your finger up someone's nose. Why would that bother you? Only you get paid for it. So, since all of that's so marvellous, um, how do we explain that these women are suffering? Well, that must be because of the horrible, horrible moralists who make them feel bad about it. So, you nasty Christians, you need to shut up because you're making these, you are responsible now for these deleterious life outcomes that these women are suffering. So, what we need to do is we need to have more visibility and celebration of sex work. <laughs> <laughs> 
And these people are making these arguments in Parliament, would you believe? So they're sort of clothed in some sort of respectability. And then if we look at arguments for children's sexual rights, well, how do we explain that children who have sex with adults are traumatised? Uh, well, it can't be the sex, can it? Because we know from Kinsey that that's got nothing to do with it, and children are sexual from birth. So how is it that children are then made to feel terrible for what comes naturally? Well, that must be hysterical, overreactive, unenlightened parents, teachers, or legal authorities who tell them that they've done something wrong. You see, so that shame and that stigma, that's what's responsible for all of the terrible life outcomes for children who have sex with, with adults. So whenever we, the more loudly we say, look, this is a terrible thing for children, they stand there and they say, I know, and you're the ones doing it. So this is, this is how this plays out. No, it's the abusive parent. If you, talk to, if you listen in to what the pedophiles call an abusive parent, an abusive parent is someone who wants to stop pedophiles having sex with their children because pedophiles are loving. It's this incredible inverted moral universe. It's extraordinary, but this is the way the ideology works. Now, when you come to LGBT rights, you'll, you'll see exactly the same thing. We've got LGBT kids and they're suffering um, and, and actually they're just being empowered in who they really are and yet they have terrible life outcomes. Well, why must that be? That must be because of those nasty Christians, so we need to make them shut up. So the thing to notice is that this is the rhetoric of people who have a personal, commercial or political interest in the exploitation of the vulnerable. And if you then think on the evidence that an LGBT identification in a child is just a big flag for vulnerability, well, who wants those people to come forward and be visible? People who want to sexually exploit them. Vulnerable women are much more easily groomed into the sex industry than non-vulnerable women. Vulnerable children are much more easily recruited to an LGBT culture which must recruit than, than non-vulnerable children. So this is a big flag for vulnerability and what we're doing is we're saying, come forward and we'll celebrate you and let's be visible about that. So actually I think there's something very sinister going on here. The next, in order to understand the usefulness of the born that way narrative though, I'll just, this, I'm nearly, nearly at the end, but I just want to explain why the sexual diversity crowd aren't blowing it out of the water. Because it's funny that this idea of the pathologized homosexual came from uh, the wish to other and demonise and isolate um, homosexuals, and now it's actually been co-opted to, to be a politically useful tool for them. And the reason it's a politically useful tool is because if, whether you believe orientation or sexual diversity, it gives you this common ground, that an LGBT identification is not in itself a sign of brokenness. And if you say that out loud, actually, I think, I think there's something wrong with them well then that's a horrible, hateful thing to say. Actually, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with them, I'm saying this is a sign of a traumatised person. There's something here that we need to dig into and help them with, and who doesn't want to help them? Well, but anyway, so that's why the orientationists are useful to the sexual diversity crowd, because it gives you this common ground. It says that an LGBT identification is not in itself a sign of brokenness, therefore all the suffering that is notable for this group must be to do with stigma. So, if you, and that's very politically useful if you look at how that plays out. So what about recruitment to an LGBT identity? Do you think you can recruit someone? Well, the orientationists will say, oh, of course you can't because it's fixed at birth. And the liberationists will say, well, of course you can and it's absolutely essential that we do because that's consistent with liberation. You know, they've been stuffed into heteronormativity and now they're free to be who they really are. What about conversion therapy? What does that mean? If you talk to the orientationists, they'll say, well, conversion therapy is, is futile because you're not going to change someone's orientation and it creates stigma, so we shouldn't do that. And the sexual diversity people will say conversion therapy is just trying to stuff somebody back into the heteronormative box that we've managed to liberate them from, so it's a horrible thing to do. What about comprehensive sexuality education? If you say to the orientationists, the people that believe born that way, well, they'll say, we know that there are a few LGBT kids in the room who are LGB, and it's really important that they know about safe gay sex. And if you talk to the sexual diversity people, they'll say, well, we know that actually lots of kids would like to try this if they just knew how to do it. So this is our opportunity to teach gay sex to all of the school's children in the room. Now, if you talk about safe schools, the orientationists will believe it's just about stopping bullying for that fixed minority of people who are LGB, but the diversity people say, no, no, it's actually about disrupting heteronormativity in the school system, because they're Marxist, you see, and, that, and this is a great opportunity for them to brainwash the next generation. 
What do we think about religious schools? Well, the born that way people might agree that it's, it's harmful and discriminatory because what if a, a teacher suddenly decides they're gay and that now they have to lose their job? Um, and then the sexual diversity people will say this is a major obstacle to the queer revolution because a third of Australian kids go to independent schools and that's a big percentage of the demographic that they're not getting access to. So that's why the big attack on religious schools. And then if you talk to this group, you realise that we're actually using the same words to speak a different language. So if you say abusive parent or homophobia, inclusion, diversity, hate speech, what do these things mean? And they mean very different things depending on which ideological filter you hear them through. So in conclusion, I don't think we should believe the born that way narrative. It's far too useful to the opposition, to the real radicals who are out there. And the people who agree with it, mainstream Australia, are being overly simplistic, including Peter Fitzsimons. They're being useful idiots in supporting an ideology that they have imperfectly understood. So this term, useful idiots, was coined by Lenin to describe Americans who came to the Soviet Union and came home saying, it's so marvellous, knowing nothing at all about the gulags. They were useful idiots. They were doing our job for us, but they actually don't understand what it's all about. And I think that the people who believe in born that way are, are taking a shortcut for a start because they're not really understanding the, the issues, but it's remorseless. It's completely not compassionate to LGBT people. So the stigma narrative needs to be understood as part of the machinery of exploitation. We should have nothing to do with it because these are complex issues with multi-factor causation and, and a simplistic one-size-fits-all explanation doesn't cut it. But we as Christians need not be ashamed for refusing to march in the rainbow parade. We can stand firm on the high moral ground, which is that the human person is more than a sexual identity. All people are equal, but all behaviours do not have equally good outcomes. Thank you. Yeah.